Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I would like to welcome everybody to our today uh, session uh, of the Dynamo Express webinar series. <laughs> And today, my colleague, um, Christoph Schmid, will give a talk about implicit, or more in particular, he will give a talk about uh, do's and don'ts, or helps you with uh, um, tracking convergence errors or convergence problems in an implicit simulation. Um, with that being said, I want to hand over to my colleague, Christoph. Can you hear me? Yes, Mike, I can hear you. Um, so, so yeah. You can take the ball. Yep, okay. Okay, thank you, Mike, uh, for the introduction. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to our Dynamo Express webinar series. And it's really nice for me to see uh, the interest of so many of you into our short webinar here. My name is Christoph Schmid, and I want to fill the next hour approximately with some tips and tricks for your ongoing everyday implicit simulation. And what I would like to start with is why at all should you go for an implicit analysis? And I want to draw your attention first to this graph on the right here, and you see here two axes. One shows the non-linearity and the other one the duration of your simulation, the model you like to simulate. And it's clear for short duration and almost linear uh, simulations, you could use both the explicit, where Alessandra comes from, or an implicit scheme. And just to um, draw your attention to this information here, how short is short changed in the recent decades. Before supercomputers were there, it was less than five milliseconds. And after that, the time increased more and more and more. But today, I would say if you have more than half a second, so you would call that maybe a long duration analysis, you run into your limits with an explicit simulation, and then it becomes more and more maybe necessary to use an implicit scheme where you have the ability to use larger time steps. Then, of course, if the nonlinearity is really high, explicit schemes are really uh, suited for that, but if the duration gets longer, you run again into your limits because you would need really many cores on a supercomputer to run efficiently for such a long duration. So here, in this area, implicit as well as explicit may be used, but as I said, explicit may run into its limits due to the duration. So implicit, of course, has its limits regarding nonlinearity. It gets harder and harder to converge. But this is exactly what I want to talk with you about in the next hour. Of course, there are other uh, advantages for implicit. You can simulate different time scales in your process. Maybe you start with a static loading by gravity and let that follow by a transient loading or vice versa. Typical applications like you see them are also on our uh, and the examples websites are metal forming, roof crush, door sag, dummy seating. So those are examples from the automotive industry. Or strength analysis is also a typical case. And Alistina, and this is maybe also a big advantage, provides you with both explicit and implicit solution schemes in one code. So there's no sharing of models between different codes in Alistina, they use the same subroutines. They only add several subroutines for the implicit, but more or less use the same code with the same license and the same data structure, so you only have one input and one output. With this motivation, we will look into the main differences between explicit 
simply did because when you come more from the explicit side, which is the traditional one for Alistina, you may be aware of the same basic equation that start bringing you to this discretized equation of motion and in an explicit scheme, you can step forward just by knowing the quantities you have. This makes the solution, as the scheme is named, explicit, so you can solve directly the equation. You can decouple them by picking the mass matrix, which makes the scheme very fast and efficient, but you have to go for many, many small time steps because that scheme is only conditionally stable. So you never solve on equilibrium. You can check energy balance, which is done in explicit schemes. And due to this limitation of very many small time steps, it's perfectly suited for short time dynamics with high frequency response wave propagation like they appear in impact and crash analysis. Now, from that same basic equation, we can also go to this discretized equation of motion, and in an implicit scheme, you see you have a set of equations which depends not only on the known quantities, but also on the quantities where you want to get. So this is an implicit set of equations which has to be solved iteratively, where you need a linearization. So this is the first main difference, but the advantage is you can go for a few large time or load steps because that scheme can be unconditionally stable. But you have to solve for equilibrium. And convergence, as I said on the first slide, gets more difficult the more nonlinear your problem gets. So here you may be going for structural dynamics with low frequency response or vibration, oscillation, like they may appear in earthquake machines applications. Now, let's keep in mind this difference here from the many small time steps and a few large load and time steps. In explicit, you go for all those small time steps, which means you inevitably include high frequencies and you resolve all, or you always have inertia effect in your equation, whether you want it or not. And this brought a colleague of mine to this graph here that explicit can be seen as hand graph. You go through all those small steps, but you go through. It doesn't stop because there is a convergence error or something like that. On the other side, implicit, here you can neglect inertial effects. You could go for a static analysis. And the selected time step determines the resolved frequency spectrum. So you have much more control on the frequency spectrum you can expect from the uh, solution. This has, of course, consequences for your finite element model, which means you need something we call a cleaner model in implicit for the sake of convergence. This means you should avoid initial penetrations. You should have smooth material curves because you go for larger steps. So much more is happening inside one implicit time step compared to such a small explicit time step. And because you go for large time steps, expensive features like very accurate finite elements or very sophisticated material model are not so expensive anymore because you don't have to go through that routine that often as in an explicit scheme. Another advantage may be that you have no restriction on your element size anymore. So you can mix different element sizes in your model because the time step is not determined by the smallest element like it is in explicit scheme. But of course, this involves more work to get a normal termination in implicit. And my colleague thought this would be the right picture to describe this. You have to work more on your model and you have to know more about your model or your simulation and the implicit method to get to a normal termination.
And those are two of those main principles we follow in Elastina, or which in my experience at least uh, have proven to be true. To troubleshoot convergence problem, you should keep in mind that the convergence behavior is depending on the physics of the problem. So there's not a unique set of control cards which work in every model. If the physics in your model change, you should also sometimes change the method for solving convergence issues if you get them. And usually it's best to increase the accuracy to imply a better convergence. So those are the two principles I would like to keep you in mind for the rest of this webinar because we will meet them again. And now here's a short list of some of the most common reasons we see convergence problems. First is, of course, the mesh. Very coarse meshes or poor element geometry may result in bad contact behavior or a poorly shaped element may bring you a bad stiffness representation and that may disturb your convergence code progress. The next point is really important too because you can control that as said in the beginning directly the time or the load step size if you go for a static analysis can be chosen by you. So you have to control because the scheme is said to be unconditionally stable but if you go maybe for two large steps then you may include too much nonlinearity inside one step and that may make convergence difficult again too. So, for example, for contact, a small time step also is needed in implicit schemes if there is much friction or the contact situation is changing from step to step. Another thing that you should be aware of is rigid body motions. Sometimes they are hidden in the model, so you maybe you can't see them. Those are related to unconstrained degrees of freedom, and you may think of a beam element that is connected between two solid elements. If you think of solid elements, there you have only displacement degrees of freedom at a node, but for a beam element, you can also have rotational degrees of freedom. And those rotational degrees of freedom, they don't find their partner on the solid element, so they will maybe produce a situation where a beam can spin around its own axis, which will be a rigid body motion, and this will get into your linear equation system and produce an ill conditioning, which makes it really difficult to go on with convergence. Then contact here, initial penetrations may disturb two large step sizes, as mentioned at the point time and load step size, or large forces. So contact is really an important issue too, we will talk again about later. And of course, material properties are important for the convergence process too. If you have too rough data, uh, softening properties or discontinuities in your curves, you might run into trouble because during the iteration process, you may have to go beyond the correct solution and you try to iterate to the correct solution. And during that process, you extrapolate the curves you have. And if they are badly uh, put in, then you could run into really small values that go really unrealistic in the behavior. And here it starts with our recommendations. Of course, implicit has not always been there in Elastina and it is still rapidly improving. So our recommendation is always to use one of the most recent Elastina versions possible, like R11.1 or 12.0, or which was released just uh, the last month. And this is a um, recommendation which became more or less mandatory in the current releases is to use a double precision version of Elastina. If you come from the explicit side, you are used maybe to use a single precision version of Elastina, 
but due to accuracy reasons mainly, we always recommend to use a double precision version of LF Diner to improve the accuracy during the linear equation solving and to improve by that the convergence behavior. Another recommendation, if you maybe crash with LS Diner implicit, there are some nice chapters in the, the user's manual or in the theory manual where you have a nice summary about LS Diner's implicit solver with more information. Then, of course, you should keep in mind to set memory right. And I will have two additional slides on that point because if you Give Alice Diner not enough memory for your implicit solution, you may run out of core, which can lead to really high CPU penalties. And so it's preferred to run the simulation if it's possible in core. But that can be possible if you have enough, uh, enough RAM available. You could verify if you are in core by using the linear print flag on the keyword control implicit solver, or just by interrupting the simulation and type L print. So memory management has really changed from R10 and after R10. And this is the way it was recommended also by LSTC to manage memory up to R10. Here you could estimate the memory you put on the command line or in the keyword of LS Diner by the available memory you have on your machine divided by the number of MPI processes. And then you leave by, let's say, using only 75% of that, some free run for dynamic memory, system tasks, the MPI process, and so on. So this will be this portion of the memory up here, and the rest you specify is the static memory, which is needed up to R10. Of course, uh, with a small example that can be maybe explained easier, if you have a cluster node, let's say with 256 gigabytes, that would be with eight bytes per word, in a double position version of LS Diner, 32,000 megawords of available RAM. If you divide that by 16, that's because you may want to use 16 MPI processes with your MPP version of LS Diner, and you use 75% of that, you end up with a memory of 1,500 megawords. You could put that on your command line or in your keyword file. Of course, there's also an option memory two that can be specified, but does not have to be specified. If it's not specified, it's just set to the memory. Or if specified, you could apply also the same recommendation here, but you could use a bigger value for the memory value, so for memory one, for memory two, the one suggested here. But the interesting point is now, if you use a recent version of LS Diner after R10, so this would be R11, R12, and the future releases that follow, the management has changed that more and more memory is managed dynamically, and the static version gets more and more unimportant. This does not mean that LS Diner requires less memory. It's only a change in the management of the memory system. So there's much less static memory, and in the end, this should make it easier for you to enter the memory settings. And there's a nice message at the beginning of the simulation here, an example with 2.1 million nodes, it's equally distributed with 1.4 million shelves, 1.4 million solids, on this 200, 256 gigabyte uh, node using 24 MPI process, you get the exact values you would need to run the simulation. If it's a little bit higher, that doesn't matter. But you get this usage alert, and for the next time you start your simulation, you can rely on that. 
was much smaller than the 2000, uh, 1,500 megahertz we saw one slide earlier. So this is just a small excursion to using memory because that question arises a lot uh, in my everyday work with intersecting relations. But now I want to continue with our general recommendation. And here are just a list of features that you should or could use and that usually help. On some of that features, I have more details on the next slide. For the element types, it's just simple to use element type one, like an explicit. You could also use minus one, minus two, which are fully integrated. So those element types use eight integration points instead of one with some improvement. Or you could use tetrahedral elements, like the linear tetrahedron 13 or the quadratic one 16 for nonlinear analysis. For the shells, it's recommended to use type 6 or 16. I think 16 is a standard I see a lot in the simulations. And you should, of course, when you use solid elements, try to avoid pentahedral elements. And the reason is simple. Those elements tend to stiffen up or don't give good answers when they come into contact. So those elements could be used, but only to fill up a mesh that is complicated to mesh. But a mesh should not consist of too many pentahedral elements. And as already mentioned earlier, you should be aware of pre-rotations when you merge shells and beams to bricks. Then for contact, there are some simple recommendations too. You should, of course, try to avoid initial penetration or you could use ignore equal to one, which will ignore the initial penetration and remember, contact will remember this initial penetration unless it gets uh, released. Then you could try if initial penetrations are there, but you want them to be there because you have a press fit situation you want to resolve, then you could use, of course, interference contact. Or if you go for mortar contact, which is recommended in general for implicit simulation, there you have new options, ignore equal to three or four, where you can define how much penetration you want to allow. And if you run into trouble just from the beginning, it's sometimes recommended to switch to a tight contact option to ignore problems that may come from contact so such to identify where could the convergence problem come from, from which part of your model. And if you use mortar contact, you could follow what I just said about contact, or if you want to use non-mortar contact, you could try I gap equal to two. And now I gap is really a function that has two meanings if you use mortar or non-mortar contact. For mortar contact, it has a totally different meaning. I will explain that on the next slide. If you are using non-mortar contact, the I gap function will create something like a spring or a bridge between two parts that are not already in contact. And using I gap equal to two, you could turn off this bridge. So closing the gap because it could lead to convergence trouble. Another thing that can give you success when defeating uh, contact problems is to decrease contact stiffness, maybe, because the stiffness may be such high that it produces large forces which lead to convergence trouble, but then you should observe your penetration. Contact often requires small time steps, as I said earlier. If you just jump over contact events, then uh, you miss maybe important parts in your simulation. So small time steps can be necessary too. Then you should make sure, like in explicit analysis too, that the finer mesh is the slave side, and you can just turn off viscous damping in your implicit simulations 
because this is a feature which makes only sense if you have really small time scopes, like it is for explicit simulation. And the last point, in explicit, it's always good to use as less contact as possible. In implicit, contact can be distributed to make the representation of your model better or more clean or more accurate. So it's better to represent the model more accurate than just using one big contact. But now let's talk about the meaning of IGAP for mortar contact. It's a nice feature, I think. In mortars IGAP, this has something to do with the depth of the penetration. If you use IGAP equal to one, which is the default behavior, the contact stiffness is the parabolically increasing. So you have here the contact stress over the penetration depth. So it's increasing parabolic up to a penetration depth corresponding to half of the maximum penetration. And now you may want to avoid penetrations, but not just from the beginning, because just at the beginning, you could make your contact overall more stiff, and that may lead to convergence problems for the whole contact interface. You want to make the contact only stiff where you have large penetrations. And here you can scale up the contact stress, the higher your penetration gets. So it's a more local increase of the contact stiffness compared to increasing the contact stiffness of the whole contact. This is just meant to improve the convergence behavior. And here the recommendations go on. Here are some general ones. The lines that are highlighted here, here have some extra slides prepared or more details on some extra slides which will follow. Some general uh, recommendations are to use a second order stress update. So this is a quite old recommendation because in the more recent versions of LSINA, this has became already a default behavior. Then you should really try the accuracy option. We will talk about it on the next slide. Then you should try to model displacement driven simulation instead of force driven because the implicit solver can handle displacement constraints more easily than uh, force constraints. So this means Dirichlet boundaries are easier to resolve than on Neumann boundaries. Then there's the possibility to turn the geometric stiffness on, on the keyword control implicit general. This is by default turned off because it can more or less destroy convergence behavior in some situations, but in some it helps. Maybe in for structures that are under tension, where you have an initial stress which will lead to a large geometric stiffness portion. Then it's recommended to set the displacement norm type to one on control implicit solution. This can help to increase the accuracy for larger deformations. Another thing to increase accuracy is to set the absolute tolerance measure to this small value and to the power of minus 20 can improve accuracy too because then all the relative norms or the absolute norms are more tight or more independent of an let's say, backdoor, which is posed by this absolute tolerance scheme. Sometimes also a full Newton scheme can improve convergence. The default is using a BFGS method, where you have cheaper updates of your stiffness matrix from iteration to iteration, so you can choose the method. And often a dynamic simulation can be more robust than a static one, because then you have inertia effects that may cover some uh, more or less rigid body modes, so you 
could think of that if you have a simulation where contact is not closed from the beginning, then parts are free to move around each other. And that will be a little bit um, hard by using a dynamic simulation where you give inertia to this uh, part. Then you should also be aware to keep an eye on the time step evolution. Here I have a nice slide on that from here from Paris. Uh, and you should try to avoid discontinuities in your material curves, as we saw earlier from material, but also in your geometry, sharp edges of kings may lead to problems, especially when it comes to contact. And of course, sometimes you have much rigid body motion uh, and you want to have it, but then the default displacement convergence tolerance may be not sufficient. And then it may be advisable in some problems to reduce the energy tolerance. Just to avoid to find equilibrium or let Alistina find equilibrium where there is no equilibrium. This is also called pre-major convergence. So you can avoid that problem. And there's a last point which has not so much to do with convergence in the first place, but I want you just to be aware of that. That's why I added this point in an extra slide for that. To be aware of causes and consequences of ill condition. So let's step through some details of this list, starting with the accuracy option. You can try to put the accuracy option on, on the keyword control accuracy. It looks like that. As I said, for implicit, it became now the default to have an objective stress update. Uh, but the implicit accuracy option is not set by default. So you should really use, it's really recommended to use this implicit accuracy option. Why should you do that? It's of course in line with the general philosophy I mentioned at the beginning that increased accuracy implies better convergence. So you get, for example, higher accuracy in selected material models, like the well-known MOD24, which will then be a fully iterative plasticity algorithm, which is not a case for explicit algorithms, because you, there you don't need to iterate too much, because you have very small time steps, a very small time step size. And there are other things that get more objective or more accurate. For example, for tight contact, you get more physical tight contact, final rotation, get also final rotation support for some element types. And there's a longer list of all the features that are supported in the user's manual, like contact features that are activated where you have the description and see if it's active and implicit and explicit if you turn this on. So there may be some features that can be uh, uh, there to improve the convergence behavior uh, dramatically. So here's contact features, material features, and there are more in the user. And here's an example where just using this accuracy option improves the answer of the simulation where you put this disk into that block. It's done with MUD24. And here in this stress over strain diagram, you see the LCSS curve you have entered into MUD24. Now you expect if you go with a few large implicit steps inside that the stress over plastic strain will follow that curve. And if you do not use this accuracy option, you have a brief overshoot until it comes back on that curve. And using the implicit accuracy option, you get all the iterations you need in the material model. You follow that curve, although you have the large steps activated here. Of course, what you could have done also is to use just smaller steps that would have helped too, but implicit sometimes you do not want to use the small steps 
So this improves accuracy. Then we were talking about the displacement norm for control implicit solution. Like here, if you push into a soft foam block, which is made of Matsu Chan foam, you see, you push in, force increases, and it follows a, another path when you pull back this block. And you get really large deformations, and the accuracy is suffering if you use the standard displacement norm, which always references to the initial state. But with displacement norm equal to one, you always reference your conversion tolerance to the current state, which makes the solution more accurate, as we can see here. Once again, we will, so there are some large deformations. And then I said you should keep an eye on the time step evolution. And what I also recommend is to use the automatic step size control Alice Steiner has. This is activated by using control implicit auto. This is the keyword for activating this automatic step size control, which will adjust the time step depending on this window here. We have here the number of iterations you need in an implicit step over the solution time. So let's imagine you set an optimum number of iterations here, and then you can specify an iteration window. If you have now exceeded this window, then Alistair will say, I will decrease the time step for the next implicit step or the load step size. If you fall under this window, Alessana will say, this was really a nice implicit step. I will increase the time step for the next uh, implicit step. And if you are inside this window, Alessana will not change the step for the next uh, step at all. So like that, you can make sure if everything is running fine, the time step will increase and you can set an upper limit where the increase will stop and you can also set a lower limit. And if you fall under your lower limit, and this is the very last point of this slide, then Alessandra will exit with an error termination because you can specify, okay, I do not want to fall under a certain limit of whole step size. And on the next slide, I will show you what can happen if you choose, let's say, a bad strategy of the time step over simulation time. Let's imagine you have open contact at the beginning and you choose a large time step here. So the red curve is the bad strategy. Then just from the beginning, it will have to decrease, 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 decrease until the contact situation can be resolved. And then everything runs again a little bit more fine and the time step increases. But then you may run into more problems that could have a reason in the history of the deformation and you fall back to a small time step and this can really happen. I saw it uh, sometimes. You end up for the rest of the simulation with a really tiny time step. So this is the so-called yo-yo effect which can cost a lot of time. So Sometimes it's better to start with a small time step and the contact issue here can be resolved. Time step increases and here you do not allow a larger step than 0 0.25 milliseconds and it runs fine. Here the dramatic uh, part where the bad strategy failed, uh, you need to decrease the time step a little bit but then afterwards you can follow uh, that time step again. So this is a Example, what can happen um, if the time step is not chosen well? And then you should, of course, be aware of causes and consequences of ill conditioning. This is more or less not directly uh, addressed to convergence, but can be indirectly addressed bad convergence. So this comes from large stiffness differences. And of course, sometimes you have them because you have 
thin shells for varying stiffness moduli, nonlinear material behavior, but it can also come from elements of bad shape or loss aspect ratios, so that can be overworked. Or if you have fine meshes with a really extreme mix, let's call it an extreme mix of element sizes, a really high Poisson ratio, okay, sometimes you need them, but not all of the time. So these are things that can arise, maybe intended or unintended, and can lead to ill conditioning, which means the iterative solution gets more difficult due to the solution of the linear equation system. And here is just a rough rule of thumb how the accuracy can decrease. You lose digits in the logarithmic manner of the condition number of the stiffness matrix. And the condition number of the stiffness matrix is nothing else than the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue. And let's say you have a condition number of 10 to the power of 5. That can happen. Then you would lose 5 accuracy digits. And if you go for a single precision LS Diner version, where you have only 7 digits of accuracy, only 2 digits remain to determine if you achieved convergence or not. So it is really advisable to use a double precision version and to keep in mind that those things, if they are intended or not, can disturb the linear equation system, just, just to know it. And from my experience, it's always better to know a little bit more on the background than not. And here, yeah, last advice on that, if you really have a set of equations that is seriously ill-conditioned, then maybe it's better to check if you can improve your model somehow than tweaking around the convergence tolerances because then you may end up with a simulation that may run. But if you go for a similar simulation, it may not run at all again. So you could use a special case maybe. Sometimes it's enough, but sometimes it's good to be aware of that. And now I'm finished with this list of recommendations. Now we want to look at types of checking your model for nonlinear convergence problems. And there are some output and debugging options that I use a lot. So when I get a model where it's said to have convergence problems, those are the flags I turn on immediately before I run any simulation. This is especially the linear print flag, just to check also if it runs out of core or not, or to get information about line search. Then we also have a nonlinear print flag where you get detailed information on the convergence tolerances. Then you could determine the reason for termination. There are a lot of message, error, warning uh, you can find in D3HSP or the message files. And also it's advisable if you use motor contact to put M info, motor info equal to one on control output to get more information and details about penetrations. This feature is really nice because you see for example, 80% of the penetration is reached. And you know, okay, at this contact interface, I need to make sure I'm using all the, the right things or I need to rework. And there's a new option from R12 on, which is called pen out. And there are some more, which allows to output those information into the D3 plot file. So you can check that visually which is sometimes more comfortable. And in case of convergence problems, you can also dump iteration information, like the residual forces into D3 plot and D3 iter files. If you set residual plot equal to one on database extent binary, but then you can identify parts or locations in your model 
where where you uh, may have convergence problems. And when you carefully inspect your input deck, you should check if you use the second order stress update. As said earlier, the curves are smooth. Sometimes it's advisable to just let the preprocessor compute the first derivative of a curve to see if it's smooth or not. Sometimes at the first sight, you don't see it. Then you should check, of course, your material properties, are dimensions correct, contact penetrations. I think here most of the preprocessors have nice features. The magnitude of the loads, sometimes it's maybe advisable to ramp up loads even in equity simulations. Check contacts with the recommendations from the earlier slides and also the elements. And I think here all the preprocessors have nice features too. Here you can see an example of this residual plot I mentioned on the uh, aforementioned slide. Here we see in the first video that the formation history in the D3 plot file. And now you are interested in where are the high residuals? So which areas of my model produce the trouble for convergence? And approximately at that time here, 35, you can get the D3 iter file. So it shows each step. So you get a graphical output of each iteration step. And you see this is how the residual forces evolve. So they get smaller to the end of the iteration step, and they should be as small as possible to achieve convergence. And in this box, I have sum summarized some of the recommendations we saw on the earlier slide. And then for the rest of this short webinar, I will just show you a small example um, where we want to apply some of those recommendations. So here, control accuracy, make sure you use implicit accuracy. You could turn on the geometric stiffness, you could decrease the limit of iterations. One would be the full Newton, the displacement norm, the absolute tolerance, the nonlinear print flag. Here's some information on the line search, the auto time stepper, and so on. But before we step into the example or this practical example. Here are some more resources where you can find information, help, inspiration. One is on dinosupport.com. There's a card implicit under the how to's where you will find also some guidelines for implicit analysis. This is a package which is more or less a starter kit, including guidelines provided by Dynamo Nordic, by our Swedish colleagues, where you have a nice set of examples, basic control card settings, and a description of them. And you could also visit our website, dynaexamples.com. There is also the category implicit, where you have some basic and some more advanced examples up to the full Toyota Yaris um, with some examples like roof crush or dynamic suspension system loading and so on. But now I want to step with you for the rest of this webinar to a small example uh, of this T-joint component and it's run. Um, don't uh, wonder, it's run with an old version of LS Dyna where implicit was uh, also available. And I just choose it because it really demonstrates really nice some of the features we were talking about and that can be used to improve the convergence process. So to explain the model, it's a T-joint component and you have a five millimeter mesh here for those steel parts, the outer parts, 
and then you have inside the solid um, block that is meshed with solids, a wooden block. They are both models with MUD24, and you have here this cohesive connection, which is modeled with MUD138, and we use an overall contact automatic single surface with a non mortar contact, but later on, of course, we will use mortar contact. And it's loaded by this half sphere that is flying to this upper end with a velocity of five meters per second. And to connect this wooden block to the sheets, we have a constrained rigid body. So the first simulation is an explicit one. And you can see here the distribution of the velocity. And here is the answer of the force over the displacement. And you can see it's a really dynamic behavior. The process time is five milliseconds, it's about 10,000 time steps, and 52 of the cohesive elements fail. You can see here, they go up and then they fail after some time. So we have a low frequency vibration which is superposed with a high frequency response. So you have that in explicit if you want it or not. And now what we want to do is to do a static analysis of that process, which uh, will be done step by step. First, we will start again with explicit and use some slow loading. We get up by a factor of 10. Then we will add the implicit cards needed for dynamic implicit analysis. Here we could go for a fast and slow loading, and then remove the dynamics and perform a pure static analysis. Then there is no slow or fast anymore. It's no physical time anymore. If you remove dynamics, you only have a process time and load step. So this is the slow loading of 50 milliseconds. So explicit, and you can see it's not that wild anymore, the velocity distribution. And we can see here, it's more the low frequency response now that dominates the answer. But still, if you would zoom in here, you would see, okay, here is a still high frequency content. But we also changed it. We did not apply an initial velocity anymore, but we used a prescribed motion here. And damping, of course, could be used for explicit simulations, but now we want to go for a dynamic implicit simulation. And we did that with all the default values in our implicit control cards for the process time of five milliseconds. And this ends up with 100 steps compared to more than 10,000, or I stepped one slide back again, or 100,000 time steps for the 50 milliseconds. We have 2,779 problem cycles and 58 failed cohesive elements. And now we just add the recommendations, the objective stress update on control implicit solution. We add the displacement norm equal to one, decrease the limit of the EFGS updates of the stiffness matrix, and we add the automatic time step adjustment. And it takes only half the steps much less problem cycles and 52 cohesive elements fail. And if you put the curves on top of each other for the force in over displacement compared to explicit, we see here the beginning matches pretty good, but then the behavior may be similar, but is not that much on top of each other anymore because implicit simulation with 100 steps filters some parts of the high frequency response. And it's more visible here in the second graph. So the implicit simulation is somehow not giving all the high frequency content anymore. And here some questions arise, like what time step now is necessary to resolve the dynamic process? 
So this is one of the first important questions you should always pose uh, to yourself when you're running a problem, because you have control on that now. In explicit, you just go with the steps you can use as high as possible usually. So you need a good knowledge about the problem and you should know which solution frequency you want to resolve. And for contact-dominated problems, again, you would need a small time step in implicit too. Here's again the comparison between the 50 implicit steps and the 200 implicit steps. So if you increase the number of steps, or in other words, decrease the step size for implicit, then you are matching pretty much more the solution that you have or the low frequency part of the solution you have uh, achieved with your explicit simulation. So more steps may be good also in implicit 200 in that case. Now we compare the answer, the velocity uh, plot for the low and the high frequency response explicit and now implicit. And you can see the response is much more smooth due to the filtering of this high frequency content. Another point is that in an implicit time integration scheme, you have the possibility, the default of the new mod, to introduce some numerical damping. The default values, gamma and beta, are 0.5 and 0.25, will introduce no numerical damping. Larger values will introduce them. Maybe you are familiar with this formula you find in many finite element textbooks. This is how you could adjust those values. Here we've chosen gamma equal to 0.6 and beta equal to 0.38. You see, if you compare them, the peaks are much larger for the default values and are much lower if you introduce the numerical damping. So the damping is obviously happening and it also helps convergence because if you look at the number of iterations during the process time, we need much less iterations compared to the default values. So this damping seems to help but affect the solution, just to be aware of that fact. Now, we are looking at a process time of 50 milliseconds for the implicit simulation and compare the slow to the slow explicit run. So we are just looking at a slow simulation here now. You can see there's almost no uh, wild vectors appearing for the velocity here for the implicit run. And you can see if you compare the implicit to the explicit simulation, the low frequency answer matches pretty good and here we have some gap and this may be one of the next points we could be interested in but first we want to try to go even slower with a static implicit simulation so if we look at the video here we do not have velocities anymore so because inertia effects are gone now Time is not physical anymore, and we have a real static response. And if we compare the real static implicit response to explicit, we can see, okay, the low frequency answer seems to match pretty good again. But is this simulation now statically defined? Keyword here is a rigid body motion. You can easily find out about them if you add the keyword control implicit eigenvalue. It reveals all the possible rigid body modes. They are super elevated here in this uh, case. You can see, okay, it seems all good. This eigenmode seems to be reasonable, this one too. And this, what, well, sorry, the third eigenmode seems to be reasonable too also. But something is not right here. And the reason is contact. And we were talking all earlier about this I-gap function, so the contact gap we can have 
between two parts, which is really an important issue. We are not using mortar contact here. We are just using the standard single surface contact in LS Diamond. And by default, iGap is turned on. And I want you to look exactly here at that gap. If we look at a video. So it's pushed here. And you see the gap never closes completely because here some bridge is added, some springs maybe, that will help convergence, but they will avoid that a gap fully closes. So this can be a problem in simulation like here. And if we go now for motor contact, you can see, okay, the gap closes as it would in physics. So this is the more physical answer. So this is a numerical help to improve convergence, but it can destroy physics. Like you see here, you have too early increase of the force using this gap function. And with the motor contact, it matches much more the explicit answer, which I would say here, and looking at a picture, you might agree with me, is the more physical answer. You could turn off this I gap function, well, like I said on an earlier slide, but here we want to use mortar contact. So here gap closes more physically. And now we want to do an eigenvalue analysis again, because you can imagine the gap being closed by some numerical help avoids rigid body modes. And here you see the first of the six rigid body modes we have when we use the mortar contact. So this contact gap is not closed at the beginning. So the system is not statically defined. So you could not go for a static analysis because you cannot solve this equation because this set of equation has an um, infinite number of solutions. What could we do? We could just maybe increase the size of this block such that it comes closer to, to the sheets that uh, are around this block. And then we see, okay, there's only one rigid mode, mod mode left. So it goes up and down. And since an eigenvalue analysis is a linear analysis, friction, which is a nonlinear part of contact, is not included. So we can expect that in the real simulation, the transient simulation or the static simulation, this rigid body mode will be kept by the friction, hopefully. So we look again at a static implicit simulation with mortar and all the improvements we made. We can see, okay, the sphere is pushing down here. Here, cohesive elements fail. And when we look at the force curve, we see the nice five states of this analysis. From no contact at the beginning to the tipping, the contact establishes elastic bending, softening, and finally glue failure. So it's really reasonable. But convergence becomes more difficult. You can see here, if the IGAP function is on, you need much less iterations seen over process time than with mortar. Of course, with mortar, the simulation is just more realistic or includes more difficulties that we were phasing out with this IGAP function. And here is the evolution of the out of balance forces with the residual plot we saw earlier. And here you can clearly see okay, those are the critical regions where trouble may come from. And of course, we could now try to further improve this model, perhaps by trying a full new method, modify other implicit settings like time step tolerances or the contact parameters. Or we could improve the model itself. Sometimes it's uh, worthwhile to improve the model. 
by replacing the material model with some mesh refinement in the critical areas, or go back to an implicit simulation just with more, more, more steps or doing it slower. So and this brings me to my uh, summary here. We um, saw that the explicit analysis can run into its limits for really long duration processes or even real static load cases. And then implicit analysis can often be preferable and computational time can be decreased. But as you saw, it's more demanding to get a solution, especially if you have more and more nonlinearities. And to deal with them in LS Dyna, it's really necessary for you to be aware of the crucial differences between explicit and the typical setup of LS Dyna explicit features and implicit. And maybe this helps you <laughs> too, like it's helping me and my colleagues sometimes to know, okay, there is more effort we need to get a functional model in implicit, but having succeeded is great because you can reuse this functional model over and over again, change it, modify it, and so on. And this brings me now to the to end of this express webinar. And of course, there are many more improvements and details already inside or in the pipeline that we could not talk about today. Um, of course, feedback and new ideas from you are also welcome. And maybe there are now a lot of questions or some questions which go also more into detail or are already reference to some specific model of yours. And I think the best platform for such detailed questions, because here we are really short on time, would be to email to our support such that we can answer them together and have a look at the models you are having problems with. So this would maybe be the best way. I think the slides will be available soon, um, even on our website. Um, and I want, again, thank you for your interest in this express webinar for implicit. Thanks uh, for listening. I wish you a pleasant rest of this work week. And I really hope that we will meet in person next time. Uh, okay, thank you, Christoph, for this really interesting talk. And I think I can just agree with you, especially with the last sentence and the great feeling of success. I think that I think I'm going to close the session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, also, for a lot of people in, uh, interested in this topic, and I think it's really helpful, especially when you come from explicit simulation and suddenly you have to do implicit, and then you're struggling with all these convergence issues. I think this talk is really nice and explains you a bit, also gives you um, an idea on how to proceed if your simulation is not converging, where to look at, what kind of switches to tweak um, to make it run. And at the end, like my colleague also said at the end, it's very, very pleasing and satisfying if you at the end manage to make your implicit simulation work. Um, yeah, so that being said, I'm closing the session and yeah, see you next time. Bye-bye.